Exodus 2, verses 1 through 9. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the river side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, so that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take the child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that through life's challenges, you show us how to overcome You show us through our Savior, through the resurrection, and you show us through so many great men and women of the Bible. And as we study this woman, Jochebed, today, I pray that we would learn how to live a life of faith and trust. And I ask if there's one here that has never trusted you as Savior, that today they would turn to Christ alone for salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This past uh, Friday, I... Uh, went back to the city of Atlanta, Georgia, to speak at the funeral of a dear friend of ours, Pastor Dave McCoy, uh, who the Lord called home last Monday. And uh, we got there about 3 o'clock in the morning, Friday morning, to the hotel. And my daughter, Christine, was traveling with me, and we got up early in the morning for some breakfast. And uh, we met there with a gentleman who's been a friend of our college ministry. And I'd called him up and asked him if he'd wanted to come over, and we had breakfast together, and uh, he's around 90 years old. He speaks rather loudly when he speaks, and, and, uh, and that's fine, and he had some very conservative views and talking about God and Jesus, and that's fine, and there was only one other gentleman there in the little restaurant where we were, and so when it was time uh, to go on to the funeral service, I said, I said, why don't we have a word of prayer, and uh, the three of us, we Uh, took hands together and we prayed and we prayed that God would bless the funeral and we prayed that uh, God would uh, bless uh, our journeys and traveling and so forth and on the way out I said uh, I said Christine I said why don't you stay here I'll come right back and and uh, I'll get you over by your room over there and and uh, I'm going to take this gentleman to his car and so we uh, took him out to his car and when I came back to to get Christine and, and to go on to the funeral she looked a little forlorn and I said honey what's wrong She said, well, you know that gentleman that was there in the corner of the restaurant? Uh, I said, yeah, I I saw a gentleman there. She said, well, he was so mad when you left. And he was so mad about so many things. And he was mad about how you prayed to God and mad about things that were said and said, and, and he cursed at me about it. I said, well, you stay here. I'll go talk to the man. And so I went over to the restaurant and I found the man and I said to sir, I said, I want you to know that I'm a Christian. I've been saved uh, by the blood of Jesus. And, and I also want you to know I'm a pastor. And I'm on my way to speak at a funeral today. And I said, all of those things bode very well for you. You should be very glad that I'm a Christian. Because no one curses at my daughter like you did today. He began to say some things to me about, well, I just didn't like how you people were praying to your God. He said, I don't like it around here, around here from this place in Georgia, all these people talking about God like that. He said, I'm, I'm from California. <laughs> I said, well, I have wonderful news for you. I'm from California too. He said, well, I'm just mad. He said, you ought to be preaching to those people to get their vaccinations. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, to be honest with you, sir, my job is to preach the Bible. I said, they can talk to their doctor about medical things, but I want to talk to them about spiritual things. Yeah, 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 I don't believe in that God of yours. And and, uh, he was just filled with anger. And I said, sir, I said, to be honest with you, I said, COVID is going to pass. 
By the way, folks, it's going to pass. It's, it's a tough thing. We're going to get through this thing with God's help, and it's going to pass. And I said, and when it does, you're still going to be angry because your problem, sir, is not with COVID. Your problem is with God. I said, well, I don't believe in God or heaven or hell. I said, oh, you'll believe in hell the very first second of eternity. And I said, there's a way to escape hell, and that way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, you need to repent, turn to him, trust him while you can. Oh, he didn't want to hear anything about that, but I went ahead and shared with him the gospel for a little while. And I want you to understand when I speak to you about discrimination, and I want you to realize that the world that we'll raise our children and grandchildren in, primarily, in a majority sense, feels the way that man in the restaurant felt about our God. There's a spirit of antichrist developing in this nation of ours. And while some would say that they've had discrimination in this form or that form, the fact of the matter is today that there will be discrimination, there will be difficulty facing the children of the living God in recent day, in upcoming days. I think of the story before us this morning. I think of this illustration for us today of Moses, how that he was born to this woman, Jochebed. One thing I know about moms is that every mom wants a fair shot for their kids, right moms? Every mom wants a fair shot for their kids, and some moms are ready to fight for it on a dime too. They want their kids to have a fair shake in life. Certainly Jochebed did. But we're going to learn this morning from Jochebed that she could have raised Moses with hate, but instead she chose to raise him with the love of God in her heart. Now to give a little bit of the historical backdrop of this book of Exodus, the Bible shows us that Jacob and all of his family had come down to Egypt when Joseph was second in command, and there was a great famine in the land, and the, uh, Joseph's uh, uh, family came down to find provision, and it was a blessed time, and you remember what Joseph said to his brothers because they had mistreated him. They were afraid that perhaps he would mistreat them, and he said, no, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, and it was a time when God took the prosperity in Egypt under the leadership of Joseph and blessed uh, Joseph's family. But when Joseph and his brother's generation died, the Bible says that there was a new Pharaoh that became the leader in Egypt and that he did not know Joseph. And the Bible tells us that this Pharaoh began to observe the Hebrews and he saw how that their number was increasing more and more and more. And because of that, he was intimidated. Wicked rulers are often intimidated when God's people prosper and they find ways to control them. And in the midst of that situation, Pharaoh began to find ways to enslave the Hebrew children and enslave them he did. But right in the middle of this time of persecution, of this time of discrimination of the Hebrews, there was a young couple by the name of Amram and Jochebed. And the Bible says that they decided to wed. And the Bible tells us that they were in love and they came together and, and that during this difficult time for the Hebrews, they determined to start a family. And I want to say this morning to those of you that are young married couples in this room, I want to say to you, God bless you for having the faith to follow the plan of God for your life and to marry in the midst of a very wicked culture that really glorifies everything but marriage. You have chosen to honor God this morning. And I say to you, God bless you for following God's plan in the midst of such a perverse and wicked society as America. I'm thankful today for the institution of marriage. And one of the other things this man was so mad about was that Christians actually believe that marriage is to be between a man and a woman. And I, I help you to understand this morning where you're at. The Bible is very clear that God brought Adam and Eve in the garden. And the first wedding was between Adam and Eve. And we're just staying with what the Bible says here at Lancaster Baptist Church. Well, this was the world that Moses was born into. And as he is born into this, the discrimination is only intensifying. 
I remember years ago going to the British Museum, and I was having the time of my life. I mean, someday I'm going to go there. I'd love to go there for a week and walk around. There's so much biblical archaeology in the British Museum. But my kids were like, Dad, this is boring. Let's go get ice cream. Let's go do this or that. But there were so many things. And one of the things I took a picture of, it just amazed me, was this brick. Fellas, if you'll show it here. And, and it had the, the insignia of Ramses II from 1550 B.C., and it was brought out of Egypt to this British Museum. As, as just a piece of history to remind us of what the Hebrews did there. They were building the pyramids and the canals. They were the slave labor of the Egyptians at this particular time. And so the Bible says in Exodus 1.11 that Pharaoh set taskmasters over them to afflict them. And finally, Pharaoh got so frustrated with the growth of the Hebrew children in population, he determines a plan that many wicked dictators have determined in world history, and that was the genocide of these people by the taking of the children, especially the males that were born, he gave an edict in Exodus 1.16 that whenever the midwives saw that a male child was born, they were to kill the male child. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. You may have had some tough times. Maybe you've been mistreated because of your cultural background, your race, your faith, whatever the case today. But none of us can say that someone tried to kill our firstborn because of our ethnicity or because of our faith. How many of you would agree with me that Jochebed was facing real racial discrimination in her life? It was amazing. The hatred was unbelievable. So how would she overcome this? How does a person of faith face such discrimination and difficulty? Well, this morning I want you to learn three truths with me, and we're going to survey the life of Jochebed and Moses. And I want you to learn with me, first of all, that there was the ministry of a mom involved here. And secondly, we're going to see the mercy of God in her life. And thirdly, we're going to see the making of Moses as a man of God. Let's begin with the ministry of mom. Notice, if you would, in verse 2, what the Bible tells us of Exodus chapter 2. It says, And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now, sometimes you don't want to rush through something. So just notice very clearly in verse 2, the woman conceived and bare a son. Here we see this mother, Jochebed. She is going to lovingly protect her child. Her ministry will be to lovingly protect protect him. The Bible tells us that she conceived and bare a son. I want to remind you very briefly this morning as we just consider that significant fact of conception and birth that life is a gift from God. The Bible says, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of, of the womb is his reward. The Bible indicates in Jeremiah 1 5 that God recognizes life at conception and that the fruit of the womb is his reward and life is not something that is given or taken by medical science or by men but life is the gift from God you say well are you telling us that you're pro-life no I'm telling you that God is pro-life that God is our maker and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made a professor at an acclaimed medical school was teaching some ethics classes to his students and he said to the students, he said, here's the family history. The father has syphilis, the mother has TB. They already have four children. The first is born blind, the second died, the third is deaf, the fourth is born with TB. Now the mother is pregnant again. And the parents come to you for counsel and they're willing to have an abortion. They'll do whatever you say. Well, the students began to discuss this. They were placed in consultation groups, and they were to come back and render their decision to the professor, and they came back unanimously recommending an abortion for this woman. The professor said, congratulations, you just took the life of Beethoven. I'm going to tell you that when men determine to take these issues into their own hands, they are sinning against God. Life is the reward 
of God. And the Bible says that Joseph, or that Moses rather, was a goodly child. He was beneficial. He was a blessing to them. And we see that she was blessed to receive this child and that she was responsible for this child. The Bible says uh, in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, Life is a gift from God, and the training of the children is the responsibility of the parents. You say, well, how basic? Yeah, so basic, our society is forgetting those two very basic principles. Life is a gift from God, and the raising of the children is the responsibility of the parents. We are to train up the child in the way that they should go. Do you understand that the state of California is becoming very overbearing and presumptuous when it comes to influencing children. Do you understand that even in kindergarten and first grade textbooks, there are now various different art renderings that would show sinful lifestyles to children at a very young age to desensitize them with respect to the sin issues of the day. The state's basically saying, we have the right uh, to implement this philosophy into the mind of the child. Do you understand uh, the state would do everything they can to tell you uh, when and how to vaccinate your children. Let me just interject here to say that the fundamental responsibility for the sex education and the wealth and the care of children is the mother and father's responsibility. Jochebed understood that. God gave her this son. And the instinct of a mother is to protect that child. And so she lovingly protected Moses. But you know, I've seen moms that are really good at this, and they, they nurture and they provide, and, and I've seen moms that are a little overbearing with it to the point of, you know, sending off zinger emails to school principals and arguing with the cops and just always fighting for the child, you know. And sometimes that's tough. Sometimes parents in this room have come to the place where it's like, how much more do I fight for my child? When do I just let them feel the consequences of this? And what I want you to know this morning when it comes to the trials and even the discriminations of life, parents, we can't fight every fight for our children. There comes a point in time when we allow God to do what he's doing and we prayerfully trust our children to the providential care of God. We can't intervene every time. We have to teach them how to respond, and we have to pray that God will protect them. And that is exactly where Jochebed came. She had to trust in the providence of God. Notice in verse 3, the Bible tells us, and when she could no longer hide him, in other words, she did what she could to protect him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes. We think of Noah's ark. This is a little tiny ark. It's made out of bulrushes and, and, and pitch and oil to keep it buoyant. And she places this ark into the Nile River, and it's there that she's hoping that he'll be just outside of the sound of his crying voice so that his life will be spared just a little bit longer. And she patiently trusts God. When she places him in this river, she's saying, God, I, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything that I can do. I remember when my mother uh, took me to the airport and I was going to leave for college and she was a missionary in South Korea and, and I, I was now of age to go to college and, and, and my mom cried the entire way down to flight 002, Seoul to LA. I didn't understand it till I had my own kids. Boy, she was relinquishing me to the care of Almighty God. And Jochebed came to that place where she had to trust the Lord. Hebrews eleven twenty three by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. She was saying, oh Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. And, and she had to trust God for judgment. So many times today, the world out there is taking things into their own hands and, and, and they wanna find ways to fight the system. And Jochebed could have done many things. Jochebed could have organized all of the Hebrew women to march. She could have uh, tried to plot a plan to poison the Pharaoh. She could have said, hey, I know what we'll do. Let's throw chairs through the windows at Starbucks and burn the cop cars. That's what we can do. But instead, she chose to trust God. I'm telling you this. The way that a Christian responds to discrimination is very different than the way the unsaved man responds to it. 
Look, if you would, in your notes for just a moment. Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Do you understand that the Baptists have not gone around historically with guns telling people to become Baptists? We have done our best to live peaceably with all men. The Baptists were not a part of the Crusades, killing people, uh, making them become Baptists. We believe in individual soul liberty. People need to come to Christ as God leads them to do so. We need to be at peace with people. Notice verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Set your wrath aside, for it is written. This is very important, church. It is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Listen, there comes a point when somebody is mistreating you. You have your recourse legally. You have your recourse of conversation, going to the school teacher, the principal, whatever you need to do. And do that with love as a good Christian. Somebody help me here this morning. You can, re- you can communicate. You can deal with these things. But there comes a point uh, when, when we recognize the words of God who says, vengeance is mine. And it's not my place to always carry out an act of vengeance. There comes a point when you say, God, this is not fair. But Lord, I'm going to trust you in this moment. I'm going to believe that you can take care of this better than I can. Verse 20, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. So in such doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm telling you the way the world responds in this angry, divisive world in which we live is not the way that a Christian should respond. And we see the ministry of a mom. Jochebed was not a raging, angry person. She was a prayerful, trusting person to the extent putting her child out into the river, saying, God, I don't know what else to do, but I'm trusting in you. The ministry of a mom. Thank God for godly, prayerful moms. But notice, secondly, the mercy of God. Injustice is dissolved by the mercy of God. God, the great need of this nation today is revival. Men and women turning back to God today and finding mercy at the cross. Notice the mercy of God shown to Jochebed. Would you look at chapter 2 and verse 5? And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags... She sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him. Notice that phrase. She had compassion on him. Would you say that, please? She. Wait a minute. The daughter of the most powerful man in the world has just seen Moses, and she had compassion on him. And this is not a coincidence. This is providence. This is God's plan. God saw little Jochebed. God saw her heart. God heard her prayers. And God is going to lead this powerful and wealthy woman to Moses because that's the God that we serve. He hears and answers prayer. The Bible says in verse 7, Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women? How many of you would like to have a sister like that? What a wonderful sister. And notice what she says in verse 8. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Here we see that Jochebed, because of the mercy of God, is being allowed to care for her own son. Spurgeon said, God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. God is always working on our behalf. And so she's allowed to provide for her son. But this is, this is amazing, just to show you how good God is. She is paid to provide for her son. Did you see that in verse 9, Exodus 2, 9? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. She was paid to feed her own child. That's how good our God is. Can I get an amen on that this morning? What a good God we have. Now, Jochebed probably had Moses for maybe five to six years, his 
his early developmental years, which every child psychologist will tell you are the most important years in the child's upbringing. A lot can be given to a child by age six. I saw an article this week about a public school that was celebrating the fact that their students were able to read by the fourth grade. Some of you will see the kindergarten graduation at Lancaster Baptist School every spring, and you'll watch five-year-olds stand up and read chapters of the Bible to the entire congregation. Children can learn much in those early years. And Jochebed would have the privilege of forming him and training him during that time. And so mercy was shown to Jochebed. She could have tried to fight her way out of the situation, but she trusted God with her child. And God showed mercy to Jochebed, and God showed mercy to Moses as well. The Bible tells us in verse 6, And when she had opened it, she saw the child and the babe wept, and she had compassion on him. Pharaoh's daughter had compassion, and she brought Moses into her home, and she blessed Moses. And, and Moses was educated in the finer ways of the Egyptian life, Acts seven twenty one. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Now listen very carefully. Sometimes when we feel discriminated against, whether at a workplace discrimination, whether a racial thing or because of our faith, when you feel this, sometimes it's important that we stop and that we pause God and pause and thank God for his blessings on our life. And I want you to get the picture. Moses was placed into that ark. Moses was retrieved by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses is now receiving a fine education in Egypt. And what I want you to know is that when things are going bad, when we get the big picture, normally there's still something to be thankful for. And the way to overcome the hurt of discrimination is to in everything give thanks and to stop and look at the good things that God has done for you. Psalm 106 and verse 1, praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let me illustrate it this way. I believe that it is by God's mercy that he brought all of us to the United States of America. I am thankful today to be an American. You say, this country has got so many problems, believe me. I've spent 40 years preaching and trying to address those problems biblically. I know we have problems. But I am thankful to be an American. And we should all be thankful for that. I believe it's by God's mercy that he brought us here. For, for example, I think of those Baptists who came from Holland to America. They were being persecuted and murdered by the Roman Catholic Church. They came to have freedom to worship. I think of the French Huguenots who in the 1500s on the massacre of Bartholomew, tens of thousands of them were killed in one day because they stood against Rome. I think of those who were brought here by the sin of slavery how tragic the entire situation was and how mistreated people were even when they got here. But somehow, by God's grace, here we are, generations after the Puritans and the Anabaptists and generations after slavery. Hey, we're sitting in a church, most of us, we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. I'm telling you, no matter how much trouble you've seen, no matter how much trouble your family has seen, we are blessed to be Americans and to be Christians seated in this auditorium. And God's people ought to find something to be thankful for. Amen. We ought to take time because the Bible says, in everything give thanks. And those that do not know the Lord whose hearts are filled with bitterness and ingratitude, their only answer is more rage and more rage and more divisiveness and more baiting of one another into an argument. But if you know God, you know this, that no matter what's going on in your life and no matter how bad the situation is, you still have something to say. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. I'm just saying that no matter what you're going through today, don't forget to give thanks to the Lord. But can I say this? More than being an American, the greatest thing about coming to America, the greatest thing about being here today is that we can know Jesus Christ as our Savior. I'm thankful to be an American, but much more than that, I'm thankful to be a Christian this morning. 
The Bible says in your notes there, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. We are saved by the grace of God. We're saved because of the mercy of God. And so no matter how somebody mistreats you tomorrow, you have a God who loves you and gave his son to die for your sin. And so we see the ministry of a mom, her ministry was to trust God. We see the mercy of God. God saw Jochebed's faith, and God blessed Jochebed, and God blessed Moses. And in the midst of all of the discrimination, they were able to be thankful for the blessing of God upon their life. And then I want you to see finally this morning the making of Moses. We'll just do a quick survey of Moses' life. We're going to see how God, in preserving this man, would one day allow him to be the deliverer of an entire nation. The making of Moses. We see him made, first of all, in his identity. We have our identity in Christ. We are, according to Ephesians 1, 6, accepted in the beloved. We don't perform in order to have his blessing. We are blessed by him, by his grace and his presence in our life. But Moses identifies as a child of God. He was in Egypt some 35 years, but he never forgot those early years of instruction. Notice, if you would, and you notice Hebrews 11, 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now notice in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Moses grew up to be a man who purposefully identified with God and his people. He identified as a Hebrew. He was in the Egyptian world, but he identified as a child of God. And ladies and gentlemen, we live in a fallen, sinful world, but we should be identifying as children of God. We should recognize we're a called out assembly. We are saved people, and we are to live a distinct and a different life. And Moses, though he lived in Egypt, he chose, even if it meant suffering, affliction to say, I'm a Hebrew. Those are my people. I'm a child of God. He identified with the people of God. This was deeper than a cultural identity. It was a spiritual identity as well. And I want you to recognize this today. The challenge on these single adults and these teenagers in this room, in a culture that is increasingly anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, it will be challenging them for them to say, Look at I'm willing to suffer affliction. If I'm going to lose my job because I pray at lunch, if someone's going to make fun of me because uh, I, I, I believe in Jesus only for salvation, if it means I will suffer to be a Christian, then I'm willing to suffer. They will have to make such a choice that Moses also made. I watch some of you godly parents in this church, and I'm so thankful for you. I see you dads, many of you dads, you look like men, you act like men. You come to the house of God. You carry your Bible into church. Thank God for you. You, 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 you look sharp. And you're, you're, you're working your job and paying the bills. I want to ask you this morning, fellas, dads, where are your teenagers? It's good sometimes to have them sit with you. Don't let them sit in the back and text while you're trying to be fed. They need to be fed because they're going to have to make their choice. They're going to have to choose to identify with the God that you have chosen to identify with. And a lot of times I see men that are sharp and they're working hard and they're living for God. And you see their boys, they got their hair down over their eyes or they got their britches hanging down. They're kind of walking around like this. They don't want to look anything like that, dad. Teenagers, I want to challenge you. There's a real God in heaven who loves you, and he wants to know you, and you need to know him, and you need to take your stand. Dads, work at this with your child. Sometimes when our teenagers were in school, I would just go to school, and I'd see my boys out there at lunchtime, and I'd go up and give them a big hug, and give them a big kiss right on the cheek. Say, did that embarrass them? Yes. But I wasn't ashamed of them, and I didn't want them to be ashamed of me. I, I wanted to spend time, sometimes take the kids to lunch and just take them to McDonald's, just spend some time with them and talk to them about the Lord. A couple of my grandsons came over yesterday, and I played a little ping pong with them and talked with them about some things. And then I said, hey, guys, let's, let's pray together. 
God is so good to us. I, I want them to, to have a relationship with God. I see some of you mothers, moms, where's your daughter at? Where's your son at today? Make sure you know where they are during church. Have them there with you. Bring them in tonight. Have them sit by you. Sometimes we'll see a mom so polite and feminine and godly and coming to church and carrying her Bible. You'll see a daughter. She's got her hair down over her face and just walking like this. Like she doesn't care. Doesn't bring her Bible. Just talking to her friends. Listen, I'm telling you, Moses made a choice. He chose to identify with God and the people of God. And we need teenagers and single adults in this room, not merely to identify with the 49ers or the Rams or whoever else, but to identify as a child of God. I'm so sick to death of this whole June is the month of gay pride. And everybody's saying, all right, now, come on out and be proud of it. Hey, how about somebody being proud of the Lord Jesus Christ and standing up for Christ? <laughs> Moses identified with God and with the people of God. Moses was a man in his identity who was being made, but also in his failure. And I must hurry, but I want you to see that all of these leaders we're studying in this series called Overcomers, they, many of them and most all of them are going to have a moment of failure. And I say that because all of us have moments of failure. Notice Moses' moment of failure, Exodus 2, he moved in the flesh, verse 11. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he saw that there were, was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, here we see Moses acting in the flesh. The Bible says in Exodus 7, 24, that he was trying to avenge the oppressed. Uh, he had kind of a good motive, but he went about it the wrong way. He's about 40 years old now. He probably thought, you know what? I I'm going to help my people get out of this. I'm going to take this into my own hands. It's my time. Let me tell you something, men, about the time we think that it's our time and we're ready and we know what to do, and that's how most men start feeling as they get a little bit older, 35, 40. They think they could quarterback the 49ers every Monday. They know how to do better than the 49er quarterback. They know how to run a big corporation better. <laughs> I've had folks know how to pastor this church better. I don't even know how to pastor this church. I'm just telling you about the moment you think you know better how to get some stuff done. It's a good indication you're not ready yet for God to use you. Moses made a big mistake. He took a man's life. And instead of entering right into leadership, God had to send him to Bible school for 40 years. Some of you Bible college students think about that. 40 years of dorm life. That leads us to his solitude. Notice what happens. Exodus 3.1. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Notice on this map where, where he has to go. This, this man, Moses, on the map here, has to leave Egypt, and he's fleeing now his crime. He goes all the way back to Midian, and he spends 40 years working with the sheep. And God says, Moses, one day you're going to lead my people out of Egypt, but in order to prepare you for that, you need to recognize what it's like to work with sheep. They jump sometimes. They run sometimes. They don't listen always. I'm going to let you experience that for 40 years to get you ready for the ministry. And for 40 years, he was in solitude. And it was during that time that Moses learned how to really be humble before God. He had to get to that place of realizing he wasn't all that. And the Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek above all them which are on the face of the earth. Moses was learning how to be humble Moses was experiencing the trying of his faith. He was letting patience have its perfect work. And this time of solitude brought him, letter D, to a time of surrender. Finally, he comes to the place where God can really use him. Finally, he's going to realize it's not about him fighting the fight in the flesh. And you know how God came to him in the burning bush. If you've never studied that story, maybe some of you remember it from Sunday school. Notice in Exodus 3 and verse 2, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Verse 4, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. 
And he said, Draw not hither, uh, draw not thy, nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now God has Moses' attention. You see, so many people that are discriminated against, they make the mistake of Moses to take things into their own hands. Oh yeah, I'll write an e a strong email. Oh yeah, I'll rant on Facebook. Oh yeah, I'll get an attorney. They don't have an attorney, but they, they're going to get one. But here we see what God is looking for is not what you can offer to him in the way of your energy and anger. God is looking for you to surrender to him. That's what the whole Christian life's about. Getting to the place of full surrender. Exodus 4 and 18. And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return my brethren which are in Egypt. You know the story. Moses tried to argue with God. He said, God, look at, look at, they're not going to listen to me. God, I'm not a really good speaker. I, 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 I sometimes stutter. I don't know how I, I could do this. They're not going to listen to me back there in Egypt. Finally, he goes to his father-in-law, and his father-in-law says, go in peace. And the Bible says Moses took his wife, and they returned to the land of Egypt. He returns as a different man, a submissive man, a surrendered man. And you know the story. The Bible tells us that he finally was able in triumph to bring the people out of Egypt. And they triumphed over Egypt. He went to Pharaoh, and he said to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and God began to bring the plagues. And you've read about them, no doubt. And the lice, and the locusts, and the blood, and the, and the boils, and the frogs. And finally, the people of God are delivered. And the Bible says very clearly in Hebrews eleven twenty nine, 29, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. In certain liberal seminaries across this land, liberal meaning Bible denying, perhaps uh, apostate unsaved teachers, they teach that, well, this was just during the low tide. My friend, the Bible says there was a wall of water on either side. It's not low tide. It's the miracle of God parting the Red Sea, and they walked through it at Exodus 14, 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. Hebrews eleven twenty nine. 29, the Egyptians were drowned. I don't know how you drowned in high tide. I'm telling you, it was the miracle of God to part the water and to bring the water back in. And the Egyptians were drowned and God brought a great victory. But listen, God was going to do it his way. Moses had to learn he could not fight his way to freedom, that God would make a way. And God always does make a way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Now, had Moses' mother not trusted God, the people would have never been delivered from slavery. And what I want you to know in whatever circumstance you're facing right now is right from the Bible, and it's in your notes, Psalm 34, 19. And here it is as we close. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Let's say that together. Many are the afflictions Jesus didn't say, in the world you'll not have trouble. He said, in the world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Notice that, Psalm 34, 19. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. You will overcome your trial, not by fighting in the flesh, not with anger, but by trusting in God. Because we know that all things work together for good to them who are the called, according to his purpose. God is wanting to work on your behalf. God allows a burden, sometimes to bring us closer to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes God allows a trial so that you, like Moses, will turn from your pride and humbly come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I need you as my savior. I have finally realized I can't solve all my problems on my own. This one's beyond me. I'm out here in the Nile River in the bulrushes, and without you, God, I don't know what to do. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to remind you, God loved you so much 
God maybe has allowed a trial in your life, maybe hurt, maybe discrimination, so that you'll realize you can't solve it all and you'll turn to God and ask him for help and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, as your savior. Maybe you're a Christian and you're going through some difficult times and you're tempted to just fight your way out. But God is reminding you that he can do a much better job parting the Red Sea than you can. And he's reminding us to just keep trusting him.